Okay, what's up guys? Welcome back. This is going to be the second video of our pants associations. Um, so we'll get started and we'll first start with what do you think Coplic spots are? So Coplic spots, what does that make you think of? So Coplic spots are described as grains of sand on an erythematous base or buccal white lesions, blue white buccal lesions. Coplic spots and blue white buccal lesions makes you think of measles or rubeola. So not rubella. Rubella is German measles. Rubeola is regular measles. How about a sandpaper rash and a strawberry tongue? So sandpaper rash, strawberry tongue, and sandpaper rash is like a sunburn with goosebumps. So sunburn with goosebumps, sandpaper rash, you want to think of scarlet fever. So that's scarlet fever. How about rice water diarrhea? If you have a patient with rice water diarrhea, they can also be described as gray or turbid or without odor or blood or pus. So gray or turbid without odor, blood or pus, and it's a rice water diarrhea. You want to think of cholera. So vibrio cholera, and that's gram negative as well. Important to know. So vibrio cholera, rice water. How about pea soup diarrhea? So if you have pea soup diarrhea, you want to think of enteric or typhoid fever. So typhoid fever, and that's caused by salmonella typhi. So typhoid fever, salmonella typhi, and that's a pea soup diarrhea. How about hyperplastic prickle cells with excess keratin? Also condyloma acuminata. So accumulation, condyloma acuminata. What does that make you think of? That would be HPV, human papillomavirus skin warts. How about multinucleated giant cells on Tzank smear? Multinucleated giant cells on Tzank smear. That'll be HSV, herpes simplex virus. Erythema migrans, a bullseye skin lesion, and a central clearing. What does that make you think of? So bullseye skin lesion, central clearing, and erythema migrans makes you think of Lyme's disease. So Lyme's disease, and what is the cause of Lyme's disease? What is the actual bug that causes it? That's gonna be Borre Borrelia burgdorferi. <laughs> Borrelia burgdorferi for Lyme's disease. How about string of pearls on ovarian ultrasound? So that kind of gives it away. String of pearls on ovarian ultrasound makes you think of PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So string of pearls on ovarian ultrasound, PCOS. And what is the ratio of hormones seen in PCOS? So the ratio of hormones seen in PCOS is LH um, to FSH ratio that's extremely elevated. So they have way more LH than FSH in PCOS. And what are some of the treatments for PCOS since they're having a hyperandrogenic state and a insulin resistant state? You want to use metformin. You can also use spironolactone for the hertzitism. And of course, weight loss and um, diabetes control will be helpful. And also, if they're trying to get pregnant, you can use clomiphene. Clomiphene as well will help induce the ovulation. So those are some of the drugs for PCOS. And don't forget the classic string of pearls sign on ovarian ultrasound. So what about satellite lesions? So if the patient has classic satellite lesions on the buttocks especially, and this is a younger patient, maybe an infant, what does that make you think of? Diaper dermatitis. So diaper dermatitis, this is a candidal infection, and it's satellite lesions on the buttocks. How about Wickham striae? What is Wickham striae um, associated with? So Wickham striae is white lines that are typically in the mouth under the lip. So Wickham striae, white lines in the mouth under the lip, as well as the five Ps, purple, planar, polygonal, pruritic papules. That will be lichen planus. So lichen planus, the five Ps, as well as Wickham striae. And they can also have the Codmer's phenomena and the auspice spots, which is those petechial hemorrhages when you like, like rip it off basically of your skin, it can start to have those little red spots. So that's lichen planus, also in psoriasis too. 
So what is caused by parvovirus B19 and a patient with slapped cheeks, slapped cheek appearance, and it's also called erythema infectiosum? That will be fifth disease. So fifth disease, erythema infectiosum due to parvovirus B19 and also slapped cheek appearance. So what is a gram-negative intracellular diplococci? So gram-negative intracellular diplococci. That will be Neisseria gonorrhea. So Neisseria gonorrhea. And also notice that gram-negative intracellular diplococci, they might ask, patient is having meningeal signs and they have diplococci, what is it? So it'll be, it'll be Neisseria still, but it'll be Neisseria meningitidis. So very similar. So that's that gram-negative diplococci, Neisseria gonorrhea. How about a blue cervix? What sign is this? A blue cervix is Chadwick's sign. So Chadwick's sign signifies pregnancy, and this is a bluing of the cervix in the early weeks of pregnancy. How about a hair-like cytoplasmic projection on lymphocytes? So hair-like cytoplasmic projections on lymphocytes, that's going to be hairy cell leukemia. So hairy cell leukemia. How about Ravsing's sign, which is left lower quadrant palpation, leads to right lower quadrant pain. You want to think of appendicitis right away for that, for Ravsing's sign, which is that pain that you palpate in the left lower quadrant and you get it on the right lower quadrant. And also McBurney's point, two-thirds away from the umbilicus to the ASIS. How about a tea and toast diet? What is a tea and toast diet associated with? So tea and toast diet is associated with folate deficiency. So folate deficiency, tea and toast diet. And does folate deficiency um, happen in one month or a few years? So it just takes a few months for folate deficiency and it takes a few years for B12 deficiency. And remember, folate deficiency and B12 deficiency are also different because of the elevations in some enzymes. So elevations in MMA and homocysteine will make you think of B12, where only one of them is elevated in folate deficiency. So how about floppy baby syndrome? What does floppy baby syndrome make you think of? Also, don't give honey to babies because of this as well. So no honey for babies as well as floppy baby syndrome will make you think of botulism. So botulism. How about perihilar infiltrates in a butterfly pattern? Perihilar infiltrates in a butterfly or also a bat winging pattern. How about perihilar infiltrates in a butterfly and bat winging a pattern? And also the treatment is Bactrim. So treatment is Bactrim. They're in a butterfly bat winging pattern and it's perihilar infiltrates and also seen in HIV patients. This will be PCP or pneumocystis gervecci pneumonia as well. So PCP is pneumocystis carini pneumonia, but I think it's called PJP now, pneumocystis gervecci pneumonia. How about multiple ring enhanced lesions on the brain CT or MRI in HIV patients? So multiple ring enhanced lesions on the brain CT or MRI in HIV patients. What does that make you think of? Toxoplasmosis. So toxoplasmosis. So rose spots after the initial infection, plus a tidal agglutination test, different from the rouleau, right? So different from rouleau, tidal agglutination, this is typhoid fever in salmonella. So salmonella typhi is the bug that causes it. And remember that agglutination is different from rouleau formation. So agglutination is the agglutination, basically, of the red blood cells together, but they're not in a stack of coins like the rouleau formation is. So remember the rouleau formation, what is that in? That's in multiple myeloma. So rouleau formation is in multiple myeloma. That's the classic stack of coins appearance, whereas the agglutination is basically just a bunch of clumped cells together. So that's different here. And that's rose spots, agglutination positive, in typhoid fever, and that's salmonella typhi. What if you have posterior lymphadenopathy? What's associated with posterior lymphadenopathy? 
that will be mono, so mononucleosis, infectious mononucleosis, and the cause is Epstein-Barr virus. They'll have positive heterophile antibodies as well. And anterior lymphadenopathy will be strep. How about pear-shaped trophozoites with two nuclei and two flagella and also found in a mountain stream? So pear-shaped trophozoites found in a mountain stream. Maybe the patient was drinking mountain water and now they're coming in with diarrhea. You want to think of giardia or giardiasis. <clears throat> and what's the treatment for giardia? That's also going to be metronidazole. So metronidazole is good against the parasites as well as the anaerobes. How about a vesicular rash? So what's a vesicular rash associated with? That would be varicella. Nikolsky sign. Manual pressure separates the epidermis from the dermis. So Nikolsky sign, what's that associated with? 10, toxic epidermal necrolysis, or um, pemphigus vulgaris as well. And also Steven Johnson syndrome, SJS. But not associated with erythema multiform. How about umbilicated papules? So umbilicated papules. So if they have umbilicated papules, you want to think of molluscum contagiosum, which is a viral um, dermatologic infection. How about a flagellated, curved, oxidase-positive, gram-negative rod in the stool, um, also associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. So Guillain-Barre syndrome, and you're finding a gram-negative rod in the stool, you want to think of Campylobacter jejuni. So Campylobacter jejuni. Fruity breath. If the patient has fruity breath and they're showing up to the emergency department, you want to be thinking of DKA. So diabetic ketoacidosis for fruity breath. And those are all the ketones there. If they have coin-shaped or discoid papules with vesicles and papules, so coin-shaped papules, you want to think of numular eczema. So numular eczema, coin-shaped or discoid papules. How about a pill-rolling tremor? Pill-rolling tremor, you want to think of Parkinson's. So pill-rolling tremor makes you think of Parkinson's. And how about a resting tremor versus an active tremor? So an action tremor versus a pill rolling tremor and a resting tremor is associated with Parkinson's. And the action tremor is essential tremor, which is more familial. How about encapsulated organisms on India ink? So encapsulated organisms on India ink, that's gonna be Cryptococcus neoformans. So Cryptococcus neoformans. How about spontaneous hemarthroses? So you have a patient who's just having spontaneous hemarthroses, you want to think of hemophilia, not von Willebrand's disease, which is more mild. So spontaneous hemarthroses, you want to think of hemophilia. And so which factors are affected in hemophilia? Hemophilia A is going to be factor 8, and hemophilia B is going to be factor 9. How about triple layered sputum, signet ring sign, which we already went through in a different video, those are thickening walls on the chest x-ray. So triple layered sputum, signet ring sign on the chest x-ray, you want to think of bronchiectasis. Cafe au lait spots and rubbery skin nodules. So cafe au lait spots, rubbery skin nodules, you want to think of neurofibromatosis. So neurofibromatosis, typically a pediatric disorder. Neurofibromatosis, cafe au lait spots, and rubbery skin nodules. What else do we think of cafe au lait spots with? I don't know, actually. <laughs> Neurofibromatosis, cafe au lait spots. Um, Bex triad, distended neck veins, decreased blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, and muffled heart sounds. What is this a sign of? So Bex triad is a sign of cardiac tamponade. So distended neck veins, because we're having tamponade around the heart, which means we can't fill the right side of the heart. So we're having backup into the IVC and the SVC. So we're having distended neck veins. 
we're having a decreased systolic blood pressure because we're not getting blood into the left side of the heart as well. So therefore we can't pump it out. Therefore we're gonna have a decreased blood pressure and also muffled heart sounds because there's fluid in the pericardium surrounding the heart. So when we try to auscultate it, we're not gonna be hearing it as well. So that's Beck's triad in cardiac tamponade. What if we have a patient with classic stuck on waxy lesions? So stuck on waxy lesions. That'll be seborrheic dermatitis. Stuck on waxy lesions, seborrheic dermatitis. How about a double bubble sign on abdominal x-ray? So a double bubble sign on abdominal x-ray, that makes you think of duodenal atresia in the infant. So duodenal atresia in the infant. How about a positive scotch tape test? A positive scotch tape test. That'll be for pinworms. So that's when you kind of weirdly put the tape around the anus and then overnight the pinworms come out and lay their eggs on the tape and then you have proof of a diagnosis there. So that's the scotch tape test for pinworms. So how about onion skinning on x-ray? So if you see onion skin on x-ray, you want to think of Ewing sarcoma. So it could be layered periosteum, it could also be called like onion skin, and that's Ewing sarcoma. So we already said this one before, auspice sign. So what is auspice sign? Auspice sign is pinpoint bleeding on peeling of the scabs. That's in psoriatic skin. So auspice sign, pinpoint peeling on the scabs. How about the most common cause of skin cancer with the best prognosis? What kind of skin cancer is that? That'll be basal cell carcinoma. Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. What are the EKG findings on Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome? So WPW, the signs are a delta wave on EKG. So that's that slurring upstroke in the QRS. It's the start of the QRS, a slurring upstroke, which is the delta wave. So it's kind of like a, a, um, like a hill up as opposed to a sharp incline. And you also have a wide QRS, of course, because if you're having that slurring up, therefore, when it starts to slur up, that's going to be the start of your QRS. So, of course, it will be wider in that case. And, of course, a shortened PR interval as well, because you're taking away from the PR interval if you're widening the QRS. So wide QRS, shortened PR interval, and those are the classic delta waves on EKG for WPW. And what is the initial treatment of WPW? That's going to be procainamide. Procainamide. And what if you have a patient with prominent epicanthal folds? So prominent epicanthal folds, sandal toes, simian creases, and brush field spots on the iris. So all those things are signs of Down syndrome. So epicanthal folds, sandal toes, simian creases, and brush field spots on the iris. Those are signs of Down syndrome. So what is the quad screen? So what is the quad screen for the pregnant patient? In the second trimester, it's inhibin A, beta HCG, alpha fetoprotein, and estradiol. So the triple screen, you just leave out inhibit A, but the quad screen, you add inhibit A, and of course, HCG, alpha fetoprotein, and estradiol. So what would you find in Down syndrome on the quad screen? So there's a couple things you'd find in Down syndrome on the quad screen. You had to have a low AFP. AFP is down in Down syndrome, so you'd have a low AFP. And you may have an elevated HCG as well. So in Down syndrome, you have a low AFP and potentially elevated HCG. So what are your findings? What are curly B lines and what do they indicate? So curly B lines, they're found on chest x-ray and they indicate typically congestive heart failure or pulmonary fibrosis. So curly B lines, pulmonary fibrosis, congestive heart failure. So what if the patient comes in with heavy, painless bleeding in the second or third trimester? So heavy, painless bleeding in the second or third trimester. 
you want to think of placenta previa. So placenta previa, especially in the second or third trimester, is heavy, painless bleeding. And also, placenta previa can occur earlier in the pregnancy in the first and second trimester, but typically it can resolve at that time or before it gets to the third trimester, rather, because the uterus is growing. And depending on where the placenta implants, it could the uterus could kind of grow and that could extend further upwards superiorly so that it's not covering the os anymore. So that's placenta previa and most, pro most problematic in the third trimester. And um, so the opposite of placenta, well, a different type of placental problem could be placental abruption, which is heavy, painful bleeding in the second or third trimester. So if it's placenta previa, it's typically painless. And if it's abruptio placentae, it's painful, but you may not also see the bleeding on ultrasound or on clinical examination of abruption, abruption because it may be hidden um, between the chorion and the placenta as well. So differences between placental previa and um, abruptio placentae. So ectopic pregnancy, what are we going to see in ectopic pregnancy? That'll be low HCG. And when do we see a high HCG? So we see that in a high density form mole or molar pregnancy. So ectopic pregnancy, low HCG, mass in the fallopian tubes on ultrasound. So again, heavy, painful bleeding in the second or third trimester. What does that make you think of? Placental abruption. So heavy, painful bleeding in the second or third trimester. You want to think of placental abruption. And also know that placental abruption can be diagnosed with ultrasound, but is more so a clinical diagnosis, placental abruption. What if your patient is a tall, thin male with long, slender hands and fingers? And they also have risk of aortic dissection and maybe tearing chest pain rating to the back as well. So this could be a patient with Marfan syndrome. And what are two more findings in Marfan syndrome? They could have ectopia lentis, which is a problem with the eyes, which is where the lens kind of moves across the eyes and doesn't exactly stay focused. So it's ectopic. It's basically an ectopic lens on the eyes that doesn't stay where it's supposed to be, <clears throat> um, as well as pectus excavatum which is that like excavation in the chest, if you will. So um, ectopia lentis, pectus excavatum, tall, thin male with long, slender hands and fingers. That's Marfan's. They can also have aortic regurgitation or all, also other heart murmurs due to the dilation of the annulus. So a lot of findings from Marfan's syndrome to know. So tearing chest pain radiating to the back. What does that make you think of? As we just said, aortic dissection. How about fundoscopic cotton wool spots? So fundoscopic cotton wool spots, hemorrhages, as well as microaneurysms, hard exudates, and venous dilation. Those are all signs of non-proliferative diabetes mellitus retinopathy. This is early signs. How about for macular degeneration? What are you going to find there? Drusen spots. So these are hard yellow-white deposits on the macula under the pigment epithelium. So drusen spots will be for macular degeneration, especially dry macular degeneration. And this is the long-term, slow, progressive type. How about what is the wet macular degeneration? So wet macular degeneration is a... This is a fast, progressive, neovascularized macular degeneration. So new vessels are being formed, and VEGF inhibitors are the treatment. So vessel endothelial growth factor inhibitors are the treatment. And that's something like bevacizumab. How about fundoscopic cotton wool spots, hemorrhages, microaneurysms, hard exudates, and neovascularization? That'll be proliferative diabetes, retinopathy, except that's a late finding. 
How about somebody with negatively birefringent needle-shaped crystals? So negatively birefringent needle-shaped crystals. That's going to be gout. And what are the drugs that can precipitate gout? So what are the drug-induced causes of gout? That'll be DAN, diuretics, aspirin, and niacin. So DAN, DAN, are the precipitants of gout. What if they're positively birefringent rhomboid-shaped crystals? So positively birefringent rhomboid-shaped crystals, that's going to be pseudogout. So pseudogout. How about fundoscopic areolar constriction, flame hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, hard exudates, silver copper wiring, and AV nicking? That's going to be hypertensive retinopathy. How about if they have a sunburst on x-ray? Codman's sign, periosteal elevations form an angle with the bone cortex. So that's a sunburst or a Codman's sign. You want to think of osteosarcoma. And we already said about Ewing sarcoma. And what kind of findings was that on x-ray? That was the onion skinning sign on x-ray. So onion skinning for Ewing sarcoma and sunburst in Codman's sign with the periosteal elevation and the angle of the bone cortex um, with osteosarcoma. So what if a patient has multiple small volcanic shaped ulcers on barium swallow? Multiple small volcanic shaped ulcers on barium swallow? That'll be herpes esophagitis. So herpes esophagitis. How about a corkscrew? esophagus on barium swallow. If they're having a corkscrew esophagus on barium swallow, makes you think of esophageal spasm. Cullen and Gray-Turner sign. What do Cullen and Gray-Turner signs signify and where are those located? So that'll be necrotizing or hemorrhagic pancreatitis. And Cullen sign is a C, so it, it's almost like a circle, so it's around the belly button, the umbilicus. So Cullen sign is that hemorrhaging around the umbilicus. In Gray Turner sign is what you see on the flanks. If you turn over, you're going to see the Turner sign, Gray Turner sign, on the flanks. So that's flank ecchymosis. How about large, deep, linear ulcers on barium swallow? So large, deep, linear ulcers on barium swallow. That'll be CMV, cytomegalovirus esophagitis. So how that can be remembered is cytomegalo, so mega is large, virus esophagitis, so large cytomegalovirus. Readers or writer's arthritis or reactive arthritis, what are the signs and symptoms of reactive arthritis? So signs and symptoms of reactive arthritis are three classic things. How I remember it is CUA, cover your butt, conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis. So some people remember it as can't see, can't pee, or can't climb a tree because of arthritis, but I like CUA, conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis for writers or reactive arthritis. How about a, this is a very classic one, steamy cornea with a fixed dilated pupil. So steamy cornea with a fixed dilated pupil. This is angle closure glaucoma, so acute angle closure glaucoma. So somebody who's been sitting in the movie theater and then they classically get up to go out into the bright light and then they get this acute onset pain in one eye or both eyes and they have a steamy cornea with a fixed dilated pupil, that's going to be acute angle closure glaucoma. How about a shaggy mucosa on barium swallow? A shaggy mucosa on barium swallow? That's going to make you think of candidal esophagitis. So shaggy is candidal esophagitis. So what is the risk factor for testicular torsion? So what is the risk factor for testicular torsion? This will be abnormal attachment of the testes in the scrotum. So the bell clapper deformity is the classic thing. So bell clapper deformity, and that's when the testicle is actually more transverse 
in parallel to the ground as opposed to um, straight up and down in parallel to the body, I guess, um, which is the normal, normal form. So that's a big risk for testicular torsion is the bell clapper deformity. And what's the biggest risk factor for ovarian torsion? So what's the biggest risk factor for ovarian torsion? That's going to be physiologic or functional ovarian cysts. So as the cyst enlarges and enlarges, it can gravity pulls it down and it can torse the uh, the ovary on its pedicle. So um, functional or physiologic ovarian cysts are a risk factor, are the big risk factor for ovarian torsion, and bell clapper deformity, the big risk factor for testicular torsion. So again, we went through this one last time. How about raccoon eyes? hanging teardrop sign and a open Bombay door sign. That's orbital fracture. So the hanging teardrop sign, that's herniation of the orbital fat into the sinus, as well as open Bombay door sign, which is bone fragments in the sinus itself. So that's all for an orbital fracture, or an orbital blowout fracture. How about the friend sign? What is the friend sign? What is the friend sign versus the cremasteric reflex? So friend sign is pain relieved with elevation of the scrotum. And the cremasteric reflex is when you mm, rub the inner thigh, the testicle should um, elevate. So it should elevate in the cremasteric reflex. So the cremasteric muscle will contract and pull the testicle up. And these will be positive in epididymitis. So that's one way you can differentiate epididymitis from a testicular torsion, is that these signs will be present. So that's an epididymitis. What if we see on CSF analysis, illegal clonal bands? So on CSF analysis, we see illegal clonal bands. The patient also has a Lermit sign. So they also have a Lermit sign, which is a lightning shooting down the back when you flex the neck. So the Lermit sign is the lightning shooting down the back when you flex the neck. They're having illegal clonal bands, and the epidemiology is more common in colder regions, so Canada has way more of this disease. And that would be multiple sclerosis. And multiple sclerosis is also most common in young to middle-aged females as well, in multiple sclerosis. And the first sign occasionally is optic neuritis. So middle age to young female with um, visual symptoms, you want to be thinking also of multiple sclerosis. So what is pellagra and what is a, this a deficiency of? So pellagra is the three Ds, diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia. So diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia is pellagra, and that's a niacin deficiency, so a B3 deficiency. So pellagra, diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia, and that's a niacin B3 deficiency. And so what is the symptom of niacin if you take it in too fast? And how can that be, how can that be stopped by ingesting what? So that would be a flush, so a red flushing of the skin, an extreme flushing of the skin if you have an intake of niacin quickly, and it can be stopped by taking aspirin or an NSAID 30 minutes before you ingest the niacin as well. So you have that flushing. And niacin also helps in cardiovascular disease. How? It's the best drug to, to increase HDL. So niacin, the best drug to in increase HDL and deficiency of it causes pellagra, which are diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia. What would you Think about if you had diffuse vascular changes of the gray matter with reactive astrocytosis on cortical biopsy. So that's pretty, pretty abstract. So diffuse vascular changes on gray matter with reactive astrocytosis on cortical biopsy, that's going to be creutzfeldt jakob disease. So this is a pretty bad disease of the brain, degenerative disease, creutzfeldt jakob disease. How about eggshell calcifications on the lymph nodes and chest x-ray? So eggshell calcifications on the lymph nodes 
on chest x-ray, you want to be thinking of silicosis. So silicosis. Hemorrhagic necrosis of the temporal lobes on CT. So hemorrhagic necrosis of the temporal lobes on CT. So you want to be thinking of herpetic encephalitis. And what's the treatment for that? It'll be acyclovir. So herpetic encephalitis, acyclovir, hemorrhagic necrosis of the temporal lobes on CT. And we'll just do one more for this, for this um, video here, the second one in the series. And what is the um, abnormality when you have low plasma renin with an increased 24-hour urine aldosterone? So you have an increased 24-hour urine aldosterone. You have a low plasma renin. What's the electrolyte problems that you're going to see? So this will be hyperaldosteronism. And you'd have an increase in salt and a decrease in potassium. So aldosterone increases the salt and decreases the potassium. So those are the problems you're going to have. And remember, renin is secreted when you want to increase the blood pressure. So of course, you're going to have a low plasma renin because we don't want to increase the blood pressure, or rather because the blood pressure is already increased when you already have a lot of aldosterone. So aldo hyperaldosteronism, low plasma renin with an increased 24-hour urine aldosterone, and you have a hypernatremia and a hypokalemia. Okay, so we'll see you in the next video.